A very warm welcome to the Mod++ user group. Thank we you. Thank very you. much looking forward to your talk about classic vulnerabilities. And with that, you have the stage. Thank you so much. So uh, welcome to everyone. And I'm so happy to be here. And it was really interesting to watch Marcus's, uh, Marcus's lightning talk. Uh, so welcome to my talk, where we're going to talk about living in the future. Um, so. I guess this is a little bit of a joke because the whole talk, I'm basically going to try to convince you that we are not actually living in the future, but we're living in a high tech version of the past. Uh, and so this, this split screen kind of thing, it's, it's uh, something that you'll see several times during the talk where I will try to illustrate time passing. So on the one side, we have systems programming, and on the other side, we have binary exploitation. And, and these two fields have coexisted since the beginning of system programming, uh, and oftentimes also performed by the same people. Today, they, they tend to be a little bit separate and, and more specialized. And I think maybe that has caused us also to lose sight of some of the lessons. Uh, so we're going to, to have a timeline that goes uh, from uh, 2000, and it's going to bring us all the way into to the current time, into the future in 2022. Uh, so for people who might not remember uh, 2000, that was Y2K. So for boomers, that might be a good reference. Uh, for Zoomers, all I have to say is Taylor Swift was 11, and it's painful for everyone. Um, that that is that feels like a million years ago. So the talk is called classic vulnerabilities, and I learned uh, I learned way back when I was working at Opera that classic is is the nice way to say old. Uh, so <laughs> who am I? Uh, my name is Patricia Oles. Uh, I've already been presented. I'm a C plus plus programmer. Um, I worked in several companies. Uh, so my first real job was at Opera Software working in the original Opera browser, and I had a tendency to dabble in browsers ever since. Uh, I have a master's in computer science, and, and my pronouns are she, they. OK, so so what do I know? Like, why why should I talk about this? So I, uh, like like Klaus said, I, I teach also uh, C++. I have uh, two trainings, one called Mod uh, C++ Fundamentals, and one called Mod C++ Intermediate. Uh, where I teach people who don't know how to program in C++, uh, C++. So, so people who uh, already know how to program, like people who program in Java or C Sharp or some other programming language. And I, I try to teach the modern C++. And this is a, as a course that I, I co-wrote with uh, Corentin Jabot, who is a, a client compiler engineer and also a, a member of the French uh, uh, a national body to the C++ committee. Um, but at the same time, I have another training that I've been doing for quite a while, which uh, is called Insecure C++. And in this training, I basically try to teach people, uh, I teach C++ programmers uh, binary exploitation. And, and this is a part of, of demystifying what exploitation and vulnerabilities are, uh, trying to teach the vocabulary uh, of, of exploitation to C++ programmers, and we will dabble in this area today. Um, but first, let's go back in time. So 2000. Uh, so uh, for some of you, uh, you know, you might not remember 2000, uh, but for, for a lot of us, it was a big deal. We were told uh, the world was going to end, or at least the power was going to go out when, uh, when New Year's Eve 2000 uh, came along. So, or 1999, when it flipped to 2000. And uh, so uh, most people know where they were at that time, uh, which you can ask <laughs> people. I was on a beach in Costa Rica. Most people know where they were. Um, but one of the things that I connect with, with 2000 um, was this, because over here in this box, and I'll show you where this box belongs, I finished my bachelor's degree. Um, but if I show you, it was over here um, in this dip over here. And, and the timeline might give a hint because this was peak.com. So this was when I started my bachelor's. So I started my bachelor's in peak.com. And, and that basically meant at this point in time, around 2000, 
you could get a, a permanent job in IT if you knew two or three tags in HTML. It was a great time uh, to get hired. Uh, unfortunately, I, I finished my bachelor's three years later, and there were no jobs. All jobs required uh, a master's degree and 10 years of experience, which I had neither of those. Uh, so I started my master's. <laughs> But for the rest of you, trying to get you to remember uh, 2000, I want to tell you, it's 22 years ago, so that's a full-grown adult. Uh, but uh, maybe more pop-cultural reference-wise, uh, Destiny's Child released Say My Name, which is awesome. Uh, NSYNC released Bye Bye Bye, which is extremely catchy. Uh, and for the millennials, uh, this was then uh, before Beyonce and Justin Timberlake uh, had their uh, solo career. So this is <laughs> way back in time. Okay, so 2000. Let's uh, bring it back. So in July 2000, uh, a hacker going by the name Solar Designer, uh, whose real name is Alexander Pestiak, uh, introduced what has been known in, in, uh, in retrospect as the first generic heap exploitation technique. Um, and we are going to talk about this uh, because it was a very interesting field and, and something that a field that might not have been super successful in many ways of trying to make something that is generic when it comes to, to exploitation technique. And when I say generic here, I don't mean C++ generics, but, but more of a general technique that you could uh, use across uh, applications. Uh, and this was, uh, he, he was targeting the allocator and that was his, his uh, key kind of insight and, and idea. Uh, and in his original paper, he, he is talking about uh, Doug Lea's uh, malloc, but, it, but the same kind of, of, uh, of technique has been used successfully against many different implementations of malloc. Uh, and, and the idea was to somehow create a portable exploit uh, that you could use a, a, across many different applications. And this is, is uh, a problem that exists today as well, or a feature possibly, depending on where you stand, is that uh, exploitation uh, engineers need to, to specialize in specific applications because it takes a lot of time to, to, to get to know the binary, basically. Uh, and you spend a lot of time creating per application uh, exploits and, and finding vulnerabilities in the specific application. So the idea here was that if we can exploit the, the, the system allocator, then we can have something that we can use across many different applications. Um, and so this, this is, uh, you know, at the time considered to be a little bit of a, of a, of a holy grail or, or something to strive for because it would make things easier. Uh, but we're going to talk about this technique and then I'm going to show you how um, it's still relevant. So, so this, this technique uh, is generally referred to as an unlink vulnerability. And I, I have, I'll, 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 I'll share the slides uh, later and uh, then you can do look at all of my <laughs> resources if you want, if this is something you want to dig into. Okay, but let's look at what it looks like. So, so generally referred to as an unlink vulnerability. Now uh, we're going to talk about this in the context of Doom. So for, uh, this this would probably be most relevant for anyone who's a Gen Xer. So this uh, this was a, a game. The game Doom was probably the kind of breakout of of the first person shooter type of game. It came in the in the early '90s and was very popular throughout the '90s. Uh, and uh, the source for it was released apparently in, in late. 1990s, but then also was put on GitHub in 2012. And as a part of that, I think there was a Linux port that was uh, was uh, open sourced in 2012, and and several uh, source ports have been made of of the game. So that's basically people trying to make uh, uh, to, to port the game to make it more modern, port it to different application to different platforms like to Windows and Mac and whatnot, uh, and the thing is, in, in January of this year, 
I got uh, COVID and, and as a part of getting COVID, I, I was exhausted and couldn't do anything, but I was at the same time extremely bored. So I picked up, uh, and a lot of you might know um, uh, Jason Turner uh, from C++ Weekly and CPP Cast, and he had uh, previously, uh, two years earlier, uh, tried to do a port of, of Doom, uh, uh, Crispy Doom, which is, is a fork of Chocolate Doom, uh, but to, to port that over to C++, and he called it CPP uh, Doom. And so I basically just picked it up and uh, tried to, to uh, build it, basically. <laughs> Uh, and and he hadn't finished. Uh, and if you want to go through what he had done, he has like a ten hour stream where he talks about this. But but basically, I spent the time trying to finish uh, finish this and have it running. And so it's on GitHub on my GitHub now. If you want to try it, I, I'm basically planning to use it for for future insecure insecure C plus training where we are going to exploit Doom hopefully. Uh, but anyway, this is the framework we're going to use for uh, this. Uh, this vulnerability. So in, inside of Doom, uh, there are uh, two allocators, uh, one called uh, the Z malloc and one called, uh, so there's a native malloc and, yeah, and a zone malloc. Uh, and in this case, we're going to look at the Z malloc. Uh, and so the basic idea is if you have an allocator, what you basically want in a, in a regular uh, low-level C allocators, you want to be able to, to provide a, a malloc and a, a free uh, primitive. And then probably you want something more uh, advanced, maybe. In this case, that's uh, pretty much what is supported by Z malloc. Uh, so this is uh, the allocator for Doom, and, and we'll look at some of that. In addition to, to the actual memory that is allocated by malloc, it also will allocate this little metadata section that it will use internally for its own use. And, and that is going to be uh, central to, to, uh, to our, our process here. Um, yes. Okay, so if we go and have a look at it, an, uh, an allocation would look something like this. Uh, so here we have a call to Z malloc. And, and a lot of my example code is from my C, uh, uh, CPP Doom. Uh, but but the, the vulnerability was also in Crispy Doom, which uh, was what CPP Doom forked from, and then also in Chocolate Doom. Uh, and so I submitted a patch to Chocolate Doom uh, and it was accepted. So now I'm, <laughs> I'm a committed to Chocolate Doom, apparently. Um, anyway, so uh, this is the, the, the basic call structure. Uh, it has some extra uh, extra parameters that we won't spend too much time on, but I'll show you uh, later where they go. Uh, the most important bit is is this. So we have uh, the Z malloc here, which will allocate uh, something at the size of, in this case, uh, a structure called floor move. Uh, then it will return a, a void star, which we here are casting to a floor move pointer. Uh, and this is basically what the calling code uh, typically looks like uh, all around uh, Doom. Yes, and when in, when malloc allocates this uh, this uh, this chunk of code or uh, chunk of memory that is going to be uh, be given to to the user code, it also allocates this uh, this mem block t uh, uh, ahead of of, uh, of the user chunk, uh, and this is what it's going to be using for its internal bookkeeping. And so I'll show you more. Uh, I'll show you a lot about that. <laughs> But first, let's look at what it looks like, All right? So, so, um, so here we're looking at uh, Z native, which is an implementation of Z malloc, uh, and uh, so, like I said before, you have what is uh, the memory allocated, the stuff that we're going to return from malloc, but we are also going to allocate this mem block t in front, and so the mem block t looks uh, looks like this. Uh, so it has these uh, parameters that I said we wouldn't care about this tag and user thing. And, and, and it comes down to uh, how, how, um, how Z malloc work in, works inside of Doom. And you can, you can set things to be deallocated at certain points in time or, or, or move them in the heap. So there are certain features we're not going to go into. 
Uh, what we're going to be looking at are, are these two pointers here. So this is the previous and next pointer, um, and those are going to be critical for what we're going to talk about. Okay, so imagine that we have a heap. So this is a very simplistic view of the heap, but just to give you an idea. So, so here we have this, this blue uh, object, and then we have this, uh, this pink object. Um, and so we're going to manage uh, our allocated memory, and this is how it works in, in Zmalloc. Very often in allocators, what you're trying to manage is your, your free, freed memory uh, so that you can reallocate those. Uh, but in in uh, in uh, in Doom, we are going to to uh, have a look at the or we, we have a list of the memory that has already been allocated. So these this has a global uh, global pointer, of course, because in Doom everything is a global, uh, and it's going to point uh, like this. So you have the first uh, the first block will then point to the next block, and then there will be a previous pointer. So this is this is a classical linked list where the actual pointers are living in the heap uh, next to uh, the memory that uh, they manage. And this is, uh, is uh, very important uh, because it gives us an idea that the metadata itself lives in the same heap uh, that, uh, of the mem memory that it is managing. OK, so uh, let's look at free. Uh, and and the first, the first part here, we'll do that a bunch of times, but that is basically it gets a void star pointer. So this is coming from, from the using the calling code, right? So it's passing in the pointer to what it wants to free. Uh, and the first thing that happens is trying to get a pointer to the metadata section of that memory. And that's just uh, uh, subtracting the size of memblock T to get a pointer to the memblock T. Um, but the most important thing is, is down here where we're going to, before we free, uh, free the memory for real using the, the, the system free, we're going to do the Z remove block. And so this is going to do unlink the structure from our, our data structure so that uh, we don't have any dangling pointers and things like that. OK, so uh, if we look at remove block, uh, it has, uh, it's, it's very short. Uh, so we have uh, this checking if the previous pointer is a null pointer. Uh, then we just uh, add it. Uh, but this is uh, the this uh, the next parts of this is what is more interesting. Uh, so we have uh, these two lines, and these two lines are the classical computer science uh, unlinking from a doubly linked list. Uh, also, you know, a frequent visitor in terrible whiteboarding interviews. Uh, so this talk might help you. <laughs> um, but let's look a little bit on what that actually looks like, because it can be a little bit hard to imagine if you haven't done this uh, before, or it's been a while. So, so imagine that we have, we have this doubly linked list. So the, 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 the focus is going to be on this thing in the middle. So this is going to be block in this function. Uh, and so we have these uh, next and previous pointers, which will then point to our previous here, marked as block previous, and then to our next, which is marked as block next, to give you an idea of what they are. Um, so if you look at the last statement here, it's basically checking this uh, here. So first it says if, um, so I'm going to set block next as previous. So that's the pointer that has uh, a crossover it. And I'm going to set it to blocks previous. And so that means I'm going to set it to point over here instead. Uh, and if we look on line five, it's going to do a similar thing. It's going to uh, look at the block uh, blocks previous is next and then set that to blocks next. So that's basically doing this. So this is unlinking block from the linked list. Now block is still pointing into the list, but the list itself is not pointing to block anymore. So, so this is the classic unlinking. Uh, now, there are uh, some, uh, some key insights here, and especially one that I want to point out. So that is that, that what we are dealing with here is, uh, is an assignment. Um, and, and if we can control both sides of the assignment, uh, then we can create a write what where primitive. And I'll show you a little bit what a write what where primitive looks like. Uh, so if we go back to the code again, 
uh, we have this block uh, prev. Uh, now, if we can, can control the value uh, that is returned by the statement, the, the block uh, arrow prev, then, uh, then we can control uh, the left-hand side of, of this, uh, this assignment here. Uh, adjusted for the offset of next, which we'll get back to later. So don't worry about it for now. But but just imagine that if we could could overwrite this pointer, uh, then then we have control of the left hand side of this assignment. And on uh, if we can uh, control the right hand side, like block next, uh, then we can control what is going to be written at that location. And so this is this is a typical uh, a, a typical uh, write what where type of primitive where we are able to control both sides of an assignment. Uh, and it's often then called write what where, uh, meaning that if we can control these two values, we can write what we want where we want in memory. And if you have this and it can be used multiple times, then you can basically uh, overwrite and or write to any part of, of the application's memory. Uh, of course, if this is now in a privileged process or running in, in the kernel, you, you have access to more fragile memory <laughs> or more vulnerable memory. Um, OK, so, so I have a proof of concept uh, using just a C program to show uh, how this works. And then I'll show you a little bit later uh, how this would more likely happen in, 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 in a real exploit. Uh, so we're going to, to corrupt uh, the memblockt uh, metadata for a specific allocation, and then we're going to free that memory. And, and a part of freeing that memory will then execute our write what where primitive. Uh, so, so it's a little bit of a... It's, 23 lines of, of, of code here, but let's go through it. So I have, I have three allocations here. Uh, the, the, the one on line one and three are basically just to guarantee that we actually have a linked list. Uh, so, so they're just there for a show. Uh, and then we are going to get a pointer to memblock, uh, memblock T by doing the calculations we did before, by just subtracting the size of, of memblock T because it's right uh, in front of the pointer. Uh, then uh, we're going to prepare uh, where uh, we want to write. So we have this, uh, this pointer here, and then we are uh, going to have a where pointer that points to that pointer. Uh, and then we have a, a what, so that is the value, and then we store um, the pointer to that uh, what in this what pointer. And then we are going to do a little bit of a of a pointer arithmetic. And that is to basically what we're looking for here uh, is, is uh, to subtract uh, the distance from the beginning of the struct to, to next, uh, because later on in the call in the calling code that is going to be exploited, it is going to add that uh, offset. And so we want it to, the results should be the, the pointer. Uh, so we are doing this adjusted byte where pointer. Um, and then we're just going to write uh, those uh, values into the header. So, so now we are doing just, just plain uh, memory corruption uh, where we are corrupting uh, the header of, of uh, or the, the memblock T that belongs to the pointer. Um, so first of all, we're going to just assert that where is a null pointer as it was on line eight, uh, and then we're going to call free. Now, when we call free, the, the actual unlinking happens. Uh, and so uh, once we return from free, we can uh, assert that where is no longer a null pointer and where, uh, and where where points to is, is uh, hex 42, 42, 42, 42. Uh, so, so this is the basic structure of of, uh, of the the proof of concept and 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 also what I submitted as a proof of concept to Chocolate Doom, just maybe a little bit more, but, but this is the basics. Uh, so this is just to show that it is possible. I think I, I I I made it as a unit test for my repo because I'm a nerd and that's what we do. <laughs> so, um, yes. 
So let's go back to, to the code that we are, are trying to exploit and see how this setup leads to that outcome, right? So we have the block, of course, as we did before. And, and uh, we have the, the, the block prev and the block next as they were supposed to be. So th these pointers exist. Uh, unfortunately, we have uh, corrupted both uh, the previous pointer block and the, the next pointer block. So the previous pointer block, uh, we have corrupted such that we have subtracted the next offset. So this pointer is, is, is uh, pointing to where null minus uh, the offset of next. And the, the, when I say the offset of next, I mean the offset from the beginning of, uh, of the mem block T structure to the field next in that structure. Um, but what we see on line five here is that we are going to do the block prev uh, next, and I'll show you in a moment how that works. Let's see, I think I have it right here. But I also want to show you um, the what, and so that is what we've overwritten the block next. So now we have both the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the assignment. And for for the for the adjustment, if you do the block prev uh, or or arrow prev arrow next, it is basically uh, the the pointer that that you get from block prev plus the offset of next in that structure. Uh, and since we've already subtracted that offset when we add it, uh, it's uh, we get no offset and we just get the pointer value itself. Uh, so that is the uh, the pointer where. Okay, yes. Okay, so moving on. So, so this 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 came out in two thousand, and 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 it has a similar vulnerability has been found in in a lot of allocators, usually around uh, handling a free list, which is where this is mostly uh, occurs. So, in that way, you can say that Doom was a little bit different. It was it was actually a list of allocations. Uh, um, but but the same type of of, of exploit with uh, with uh, some uh, allocations and then memory corruption is the basic idea, and then exploiting the unlinking from a doubly linked list. Uh, so it has a, it has the traditional mitigation that has been done in many different code bases. Uh, so and that is to check the pointers before you do the unlinking. Okay, so so this is a, a simplified version of the patch uh, that I made for for Chocolate Doom, uh, just to show uh, how the traditional mitigation works, and it basically boils down to checking the pointers before you do the assignment. Uh, so so we're back to this situation again, and what we're going to do is we're going to check that blocks is previous is next is block. If it's not, then we will do an exit. And uh, this is, is, is the typical mitigation. It basically means we have memory corruption in the allocator and nothing beyond this point is safe anymore. Um, and we're going to do the same with uh, the other pointer. So we're going to do also check that one, that that is also pointing back to next. Uh, and if it does, then we will actually do the moving of the pointer. So, so this is the traditional mit mitigation. It's not more fancy than this. So, so I told you that I was going to show you the proof of concept, but that this is not how you would do it, how you do the exploitation in, in reality. Uh, so how you would do it would probably be through uh, something like a uh, heap buffer overflow. Uh, so let's have a look at what that would look like. Uh, so this goes into a technique that is often called heap grooming, which I will not go into here, but if you want to, uh, to learn more about that, I have a talk called Introduction to Memory Exploitation, I think, which should be available on YouTube, um, where I will go more, I, I introduce some of these things. The idea for heap crewing is basically to get uh, more fine-grained control over allocations in the heap, mostly to get uh, a certain object where you have a heap buffer overflow next to an object where you can do some... Uh, do some good or bad by overflowing into. And so that's uh, what I want you to imagine in this case. So, so here is the mem block T. So, so uh, imagine that we have this object, the user object down here uh, that the user has called free on. Then we have uh, our mem block T, which is, is allocated uh, uh, just uh, next to it or in front of it on the heap. 
Uh, in this case here, we are going for thinking that this is a 64-bit architecture. Uh, you know, it, the, the layout will be a little bit different uh, for other architectures. Of course, you can also see here that we have this, this padding that is added to, to uh, pad it out the 64-bit. Now, in this heap crimming, we are imagining here that we have some sort of, of, of buffer uh, here right next to this. Uh, where we have some sort of buffer overflow vulnerability. As, so we're going to use that buffer, over, buffer overflow vulnerability to do an overflow into the memblock T, right? So let's have a look at what that could look like. So, so imagine that now we are getting the overflow and the overflow is then, then overwriting uh, parts of the memblock T. Uh, and it's overwriting all sorts of things. Now, sometimes you can actually like in during the overflow write in like semi-sane uh, values here uh, and and uh, but in this case it doesn't really matter uh, and we're going to overflow the previous and we're going to overflow uh, the next pointer with the values that we want uh, and so when the object is later freed uh, our write what where primitive uh, will be done and the write will happen where we want okay so this is the, the general idea of an unlinked vulnerability. Uh, so how would you find it? So, so one of the problems with this now that we are doing heap uh, corruption in the allocator itself is that tooling doesn't help a lot. So, so for, the, for the corruption itself, it's going to be hard to find it. So if you're going to use something like uh, address sanitizer, uh, address sanitizer won't find the, the corruption itself because address sanitizer is a malloc replacement, right? Uh, so it will actually replace the allocator and you will get a different one. In, in, in the case, of course, of, of Doom, uh, this native allocator uses, uh, the, the un, Z native allocator uses the, the actual system malloc uh, underneath, but usually that's not the case, right? So this, this will make it hard to find. Um, and that's also why the mitigation tends to be these kinds of, of uh, uh, asserts or, or uh, aborts or, or kernel panics or similar things. Um, because the problem is that this is valid memory that is being corrupted. It, there, e even in this case, like we, are, this is, is, it has been allocated by malloc. It is, has not been freed yet. This is perfectly fine to do the corruption. Um, so what you want to look at here is trying to find what caused the corruption uh, and that tooling could help you with. So, so for the heap buffer overflow uh, that you could find with, for example, address sanitizer. Um, and, and the test case itself, uh, it fails in ASAN, but it doesn't actually fail uh, where we want it to fail. It, it fails uh, later. So it's, it's not great, but let's let's move forward and so I've, I've shown you this this type of vulnerability and it has a very long history and it's quite famous within binary exploitation uh, so this was uh, way back in 2000 uh, where where this was presented for the first time so let's go to 2019 so in 2019, uh, there was a CVE. So this is uh, this is a numbering system for for vulnerabilities. It's it's a global numbering system spanning uh, all all applications, uh, and one was found in Android. Uh, it has been uh, codenamed or dubbed uh, Bad Binder, um, and this was discovered uh, while it was being used uh, in the wild. So we'll get more into that in a second. Uh, so the CVE is 2019-2215, and uh, if you Google that, you can get uh, the CVE description. Okay, so let's look a little bit at what that looked like, right? So, so if we look at the CVE itself, it says that this is a use after free in binary.c, uh, allows an elevation of privilege from an application to the Linux kernel. And so... This is again is using a, a, a security type language where it's talking about elevation of privilege, but it, it means that you can go from executing code as a user to executing code as the Linux kernel. 
And, and of course, that will give you much more power in the context of, of any kind of, of, of Linux system, right, which, which uh, Android is. Okay, so to, to, to understand a little bit uh, about how this works, I will give you the shortest introduction in the world to Android's IPC mechanism. Okay, so imagine here you have uh, your user space in Android and, and we have some kind of caller app or, or, uh, or service. Uh, and this caller app or service wants to make what, what will look like in the calling code as a function call into another uh, process. So this is, it, it is IPC, but it is, uh, it's, the, the, since the beginning, Android has had very good high level uh, abstractions for this. So you will have what, what looks like a, a local function call on the caller side, which will, will actually be a, an inter-process communication to the calling side or the callee side. Uh, and this works by, by magic or uh, as, as, uh, as Android uh, calls it, uh, binder. Uh, so, so binder is is uh, a whole system uh, which is based around uh, this driver. So this is a driver, in, a Linux driver uh, here slash dev slash binder, and and the idea is that when the caller makes uh, this this IPC call that looks like locally uh, like uh, a function call, it will actually be uh, a system call to the kernel. Uh, which will and this driver then will uh, will will do a context shift to the callee, passing so doing the function call locally for the callee. The callee will do whatever processing, and this uh, will return to the caller. So if you have a return value, that's how it would work. From the callers, it, it, it this is the whole process is completely transparent. But binder is, is extremely important in, in all things Android. So anything of you feel like how Android is kind of different from iOS, binder is central to that and was the central of the design of Android from the beginning. Uh, and, and extremely cool in my opinion, but that's a different matter. So the most important thing to understand here is that uh, binder has a kernel driver. Okay. so. So how this was uh, found out? So there, there is an Israeli uh, a tech company or a security company or intelligence company, whatever you want to call it. Israel has a lot of these. They often come out of the people serving in the Israeli uh, military. Uh, so bad binder. This this exploit was uh, was attributed to the NSO group. Uh, and when it was reported, it was being used in the wild. Uh, specifically, uh, yes. So specifically, it was used uh, as a part of a product called Pegasus, and that and that uh, enables remote uh, surveillance of, of smartphones, basically. So this has been used uh, for by governments and law enforcement agencies and similar things uh, to surveil people. Uh, and NSO Group has, in their opinion, been very careful who they sell it to. Uh, other people might disagree <laughs> on that definition. Uh, unfortunately, it has been used to surveil um, uh, journalists, activists, human, uh, human rights uh, activists. Uh, it has most likely resulted in the death and torture and jailing of, 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 of uh, quite a few people. Uh, working in the space of trying to to um, promote human rights. Uh, so as a whole, I would say that Pegasus is is uh, is not a, a, a global good. Uh, but anyway, uh, so so how it was uh, reported to to Google uh, was that they only got certain information, and this information came more or less from the sales pitch from the NSO group. Um, so, so they got to they they learned that it was an arbitrary uh, kernel read write primitive, uh, and and in this case, this is a little bit of of uh, these types of things have uh, multiple names. Arbitrary uh, means you can uh, you can write uh, uh, or read anywhere in the kernel. So when you say arbitrary kernel read write primitive, uh, it basically means you can read or write to anywhere you want in kernel memory. 
Now, one of the things that you might notice by what we, uh, what I showed you before is that uh, a write what where primitive can uh, be also be used to read memory because you can write what you want where you want so you can then also take uh, take uh, a certain piece of information in memory and write it to a location where you can you can see it right so so this uh, so write what where primitive can often be used to make both a read primitive and a write primitive uh, but again here so so this is the information they got there was that uh, the the fundamental uh, vulnerability was an arbitrary kernel read write primitive and also that a, a certain defined called config or a, a, a property called config debug list breaks uh, the primitive so it doesn't work if this thing is on uh, and and there are a lot of other information that is also available and and maddie stone has a great talk about this uh, that was at, uh, oh, I, I have a link somewhere, but Offensive Con in, in 2019, I think. Um, so so if you want to, to look more into to this whole process, uh, that is an excellent talk. But what I want to show you uh, is, is this code here. So when, when you turn on this config debug list, uh, this code here suddenly uh, gets uh, executed. And one of the things that I want to point out here is, is this, right? So, so if you have config debug list, this if is going to be executed. And I want you to have a little bit of a look at this part here. It says if pre previous is next is not equal to entry or next is previous is not equal to entry, right? Then we're going to do a kernel panic. Um, and only if, if that, if, uh, doesn't trigger, that's when we're going to do the list, uh, Dell of, uh, previous next. So this should be familiar, uh, based on what I've told you before, because this is, uh, this is the standard unlink vulnerability mitigation, right? And, and this is what is going to be turned on if, if the property config debug list is on. Okay, so how would you uh, exploit this? Uh, in this case, it was used. Uh, what was used was the use after free, uh, and I will show you how uh, use after freeze could uh, could be used uh, for exploitation. So, if we imagine that we have um, we have a heap here, we have a bunch of allocations. In this case, we're just going to have a look at these two things that have the P and the end on. So N on. So P is here a previous, and then N is a next. So the idea here is that once uh, this object that they're a part of are deallocated, we have this hole here in the heap conceptually. Of course, there's not really a hole. The memory is still there. We, we, we know that, right? Uh, so, so even though we've done the free, uh, the memory is still in the heap in the same place. Uh, so, so the basic trick of, of, a, of a use after free is, is trying to trick the allocator to give you this specific piece of memory. Uh, and uh, again, that goes to heap grooming, and you can look at my previous talk to get an introduction to that. Um, so... The idea here is if we can allocate our evil object here instead, uh, then, then when there is a use after free at some later point in time, it's going to use the values that we wrote and not the values uh, that were there before. So, so we're going to write, do our what, where here. And then later on when this, uh, this is used uh, after free, it's going to use our values instead of the values that were there before. So, so I, I told you a way that this, this type of vulnerability could be used uh, with the buffer overflow. And in this case, uh, the, it was, uh, it was uh, exploited using a uh, use after free vulnerability. Okay. And since the unlinking itself uh, was done in privileged code, uh, it became a use after free leading to an arbitrary kernel read write primitive. And this primitive again was was used to overwrite uh, certain uh, pieces of memory and kernel memory, uh, elevating then the privilege of the calling process, uh, and so uh, causing uh, it, the 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 malware to be installed on the phone. Okay, 
So how could you find this, right? Uh, so, so again, the, the, the corruption itself might not be possible to find. It depends. In this case, we are getting, we have a use after free in the exploitation. So you should be able to find the use after free using address sanitizer. Uh, the, the actual vulnerability was found uh, uh, in, in the Linux kernel uh, previously uh, with a fuzzer called syscaller. Um, and if you're not familiar with fuzzing, you should take my training and I will teach you fuzzing. <laughs> but syscaller is a very interesting fuzzer and, and it, was, it, it was the one that found the, the, the original bug that was patched on the Linux kernel. Unfortunately, uh, uh, this version of Android or, or several versions of Android did not have that patch. Um, yeah. So, so even if you want to use static analysis, use after free doesn't really work really well with static analysis because uh, with use after free, uh, usually the 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 use uh, comes much later. Uh, so, so it's it's impossible for for the static analysis tool to to find it. But if they if they happen immediately after each other in the same function, uh, uh, a static analysis tool might be able to find it. Um, I'll show you what typically a, a, a case where, where a tool could find it, a static analysis tool could find it, which has this property of being very immediate. Uh, so this is again inside of Doom. Uh, it has this text open URL function uh, where uh, it, it does uh, this allocation, uh, some stuff happens, and then you have a free. Uh, then we are going to, to have this check if uh, retval is not equal to zero. So this is an error condition. And what you will often see with vulnerabilities is that you will find them in error branches in code. Uh, and here we are now just using uh, the command pointer, even though we freed it on line eight, right? So, so this is going to be a use after free. The thing is, there's not a lot happening between these two points in time, so exploitation of this is going to be difficult. Uh, but usually, use after free, but there will be some uh, some time in between, code running in between before you have the use, and those are very hard to find by tools. Yeah. Uh, so this is found uh, both. Uh, so uh, if if I look at this in, in uh, this code in, in uh, C Lion, it will say local variable command might point, may point to deallocated memory and clag tidy says use of memory after it is freed. So this is something that static analysis tools will find, uh, but not super interesting in this case. So, so to find more exploitable use after free, definitely go for address sanitizer um, to find them. Okay, so there's uh, lots of links uh, to, to this vulnerability. And uh, again, I will upload the slides later. Uh, so that, that, that and gets us to, to the, <laughs> the first questions. All right, so we actually do have a couple of pretty good questions. So Roy Barken asks on, on slide 35, so perhaps you should go there first. Yeah. Oh God, that, was, that <laughs> no. was not a very uh, good way to do this. Let's see, uh, 35, yes. Yes, uh, and you just asked for clarification. So uh, I just read it. So the yeah. generic exploit is the realization that unlinking a doubly linked list is potentially right what where, right? Um, well, okay, so 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 the, the idea that, that, that made it generic in, 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 in the solar designers kind of presentation was that it was going against the allocator. Uh, so, so it was presented and had, has been used mostly against malloc implementations. Uh, so the idea was that if you can find a vulnerability in the system allocator, then that allocator is used across many different uh, applications. And so then you can have uh, uh, something that you can reuse across many different applications. In reality, this hasn't been like a big thing. Like most of the time you have most vulnerabilities are application specific. Uh, but, but again, that's how it became famous. Uh, in, in, um, and, and in our case, we also found it in an allocator, but I believe the one in, in Android was not in an allocator. It was just a doubly linked list somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. All right, then JPM48 has a question. Again, I just read it, it it's rather long. So as I understand the core of these exploitations 
um, is in corrupting the allocated me metadata. Would it be possible to make it so that only the allocator code, maybe in kernel, paging memory protection, et cetera, is able to override these critical values? And of course, there may be uh, some performance trade-off. So yes. can you restrict things? Uh, yes, uh, and yes to both questions. <laughs> so, 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 yes. Uh, there's there's been a lot of work in this area. Usually, you will find these types of allocators under what is often referred to as hardened allocators. Uh, there are are several of them, and and yes, uh, you are also right in that it it usually means uh, some sort of performance trade off. Uh, if you are not going to store the metadata in the heap, uh, you're going to uh, possibly uh, incur cache misses, which is going to cost in performance. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, and uh, and and so, and this is one of the things that I realized looking at this uh, is that since the problem of malloc is is very small, like what what the API you have is very small, mm -hmm. uh, and the the requirements to to be to make it more of a general purpose allocator is quite uh, similar, you end up with many solutions that are very similar to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so you see the same types of vulnerabilities in many different allocators. Uh, but yes, there, there are solutions and, and they usually have a performance uh, trade-off. All right. So then please, please go on. This is the two questions indeed. And yes. um, some people already said, thank you. This is a great talk. But of course, you're not done yet. This is, <laughs> so, oh, no, no. no. <laughs> but this was the biggest part of the presentation. So, so I'm going to uh, show you a couple of more examples. Um, OK, so uh, let's go back to 2002. Uh, so for people who, who uh, were paying attention to popular music in 2002, then, uh, then this might be a, a familiar scene from, from uh, uh, 2002, where we had the, the, the wonderful case of, of someone trying in a music video to, to type a text message in an Excel spreadsheet. Um, it, was, uh, it was a tech moment. <laughs> So uh, this was the year Nelly was huge. Uh, his biggest hit was probably uh, Hot in Her. her. <laughs> I, I, I can't say it correctly. Uh, but uh, the, the music video where the screenshot was from is the, the music video Dilemma, which, uh, which he made with, uh, with Kelly Rowland, who was also a member of Destiny's Child. Uh, so Beyonce's uh, start. Uh, so this is how far we are back in 2002, it's 20 years ago. Still a full human, a uh, grown human since uh, then. Uh, and so we're going to look at a very old school. And the thing is, I went to 2002 uh, because I'm going to show you some resources from 2002. But, but integer overflows goes back a long time, probably all the way into the 80s. Uh, so this is this uh, as an exploitation technique uh, and as a bug, it is it is one of the oldest ones. Um, but we're going to take it to 2002. Uh, and so I'm going to bring up a, a, a hacker zine, uh, which is called Frack Magazine. It, it, uh, it has a very long history where people would publish uh, knowledge they had uh, about all area security, uh, starting. Uh, uh, around uh, the freakers where they do uh, phone hacking and things which people might remember in uh, 80s, 90s, um, and then later on to just uh, to exploitation and things like that. Uh, so in, in 2002, uh, what was uh, considered to be just a basic tutorial, uh, uh, Blexim, a, a hacker under the, the pseudonym Blexim, uh, published uh, basic integer overflows. And so looking at these types of bugs. Uh, but uh, let's have a look at how uh, you could exploit uh, a signed integer overflow or an unsigned integer wraparound, because that is often something that people don't, uh, don't know, right? So I'm going to have a, a basic example that we're going to look at because this is a, a often used pattern in exploitation of these types of bugs. Uh, so the basic idea here is that we have some sort of code that is going to check if, if uh, one length plus another length is less than some kind of buffer uh, length. Uh, so if you imagine here, we have this first buffer, and then we have the second buffer, and then we have the, the target where we want to copy these two, 
uh, which is called buff. Uh, so this is the kind of code I want you to imagine, right? Um, so the question, the if statement is trying to say is, is it safe for me to copy first and second into buff? That, that is the fundamental question. Um, and because if it is, then I'm going to, to execute the copy on line two and I'm going to copy first and second into buff. Now, how we are going to, to exploit it, we're going to have a, a buffer overflow. And so imagine here that we have the first length is fine. So, so we have first buffer has the first length and then we have the second buffer, which is here just a little bit bigger or a big, uh, but we're going to somehow be able to control second length. And this is, this is a typical pattern that you will see in these types of, of uh, vulnerabilities. We have control attacker control data being used as a trusted length in the application code. So here we have uh, the second length and this has been passed in maybe as a part of a buffer header or something. And we are trusting that it is correct. But in this case, it, it's not correct. It's not the size of second. It's been set to max int, right? Um, okay, so now when, when we are going to do to try to do the copy, because here we're going to have a signed integer overflow. When we uh, add up first length with second length, because here there are assigned integers, uh, we're going to have a signed integer overflow, which of course uh, is undefined behavior, uh, but which will in many platforms result in a negative uh, value. Uh, and of course, negative value will be less than any kind of positive value in bufflen. Uh, and so this if test will pass and the copy will happen. And so we will happily copy over first and then we will copy over second and we will have here a buffer overflow. Uh, so this could be on the stack, on the heap. Uh, the, the basic point here is that by controlling one um, length, uh, then we are able to bypass the if check. Okay, so let's have a look at a different one. Uh, so here we are trying to to uh, to kind of fix this problem. Uh, so instead of using a hard coded buff length, we're going to use it by 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 adding first length and second length together, and then using that length to allocate. Uh, so and then we're going to do uh, the the first and second copied into buff. Okay. So so we have the first. First is still nice and clean. Uh, and the second uh, has, we have set uh, the length uh, to be uh, max uint. So this is the maximum unsigned int. Uh, and here we are going to do uh, an addition of first length which, with second length. And this is an unsigned integer wrap around, which is not undefined behavior. Uh, but unfortunately, it will wrap around and this will become a small number. So we're going to pass a huge number and a small number, and the result of adding them together will be a small number. Uh, and then we're, that small number we're going to use to allocate buff, which now is going to be way too small. Uh, and then when we do the copy, we are going to do a buffer overflow. So this is just to show you kind of how these things are often appear in code. Uh, so we were... In 2002, where people in binary exploitation were talking about basic techniques, because this was already kind of an old problem by then. Uh, so let's go to 2017. So in 2017, Google Chrome got a CVE uh, called uh, CVE 2017-15416. Uh, so let's have a look at what the CVE itself says. Uh, so it says heat buffer overflow in the blob API in Google Chrome allowed a remote attacker to potentially exploit heap corruption. Now there are certain things here we want to, that should trigger our imagination here. It, it says there's a heat buffer overflow. So, so how does that happen? And, and how does that relate to, uh, to the integer thing I just showed you? So let's, um, Let's go and look at the patch. So this is the patch that fixed this vulnerability in Chrome uh, or in Chromium, which is used in Chrome. Uh, and this is the fix for a heat buffer overflow. Now, what 
this is the, the line that was removed. And here we see an addition that is checked against some kind of total size. So here it says input element offset plus length is greater than ref entry total size. So this is the check. Now uh, it went from that single line and, and also you can see the comment on line one, validate our, our reference has a good offset and length. Um, okay, but then we look at the patch and this uses uh, uh, something that exists in the Chromium code base, which will do uh, try to only do an add if it is safe. Uh, so it has this uh, uh, check add function where we're going to pass in the two, two values we want to add together. And if um, the add is safe, we're going to assign uh, the result to end byte. And then uh, it, if, if all of that returns uh, true, then we're going to go and, and, and check it, right? Uh, or I guess, yes, yes. Okay, if, if it is fine, if the add is fine, we're going to assign it. And then uh, if it isn't, we're going to, to uh, or then we're going to check the, the end byte is, if it is greater than total size. And if it is, then we're going to set error invalid construction arguments. Yeah, it was a little bit confusing with the or and the not. I didn't like that. Uh, anyway. Uh, so if you want to look at the, the vulnerability itself, uh, you can have a look here. Uh, the most uh, important thing to realize is it, it was a very simple uh, idea. You had the adding of two numbers uh, and the result of that being checked, uh, causing, uh, causing the if check to not trigger as it should, and then that later um, producing a buffer overflow. And, and that's the typical way that uh, integer uh, overflows or uh, wraparounds are exploited. Okay, so so that was from 2002. Uh, and now I want to, so, so we looked at one from 2017, but I want to look at another one from 2021. 20, uh, uh, so this is from, uh, this was in both uh, or all of Apple iOS, iPad OS and Mac OS. Uh, so CVE 2021-3860. And from the CVE, it says, an integer overflow was addressed. Um, processing a maliciously crafted PDF may lead to arbitrary code execution. So let's have a look at the code. So you don't have to read all of this code. I'm going to just highlight certain section in this code. So, so here we have a 32-bit uh, unsigned integer. Uh, then here, uh, we are going to increment uh, that integer with attacker control data, All right? Uh, so so this, uh, this can then, we can now add a very big number, causing the unsigned integer to wrap around to a small number, right? So this is the second technique I showed you before. Um, and then that value that we have now manipulated with attacker control data, is used in an allocation of a buffer, which is exactly what we looked at before. Uh, and then later we are going to write uh, attacker control data to that buffer uh, where we now have the possibility of doing an overflow. So this is, this is uh, I, I just wanted to show you because it kind of fit on a slide where you see how this fits together. Uh, and also a lot of resources for that. Okay, so, so how do you find these types of bugs? Uh, so for finding, uh, finding uh, signed integer overflows, uh, you can use uh, undefined behavior sanitizer, uh, which uh, is available at least in Clang and GCC. I don't think it is in, in uh, the Visual Studio compiler currently. Um, you can also use integer sanitizer, then you will also find uh, unsigned integer wraparounds. Because they're not undefined behavior, they are not in undefined behavior sanitizer. So just, just the overflow, it's, it's a nice thing to get. UV-san and, and in-san are quite lightweight sanitizers. Uh, so uh, they do instrumentation of the code, but, but it won't slow your application down uh, by much. Uh, in uh, in C20, we are getting uh, safe integer comparisons. Uh, 
so this is definitely something to look for uh, in uh, coming C++. Uh, so here, this is uh, example code from CPP reference. Uh, and uh, and here we're getting this uh, std comp less and it will do the more um, the, the the thing you thought your code was doing. <laughs> uh, so so definitely something to look forward to if uh, if or when you can use C plus plus twenty uh, can at least mitigate some of these. Um, and that brings us to uh, our second questions. So Klaus. All right. So um, there's been a lot of discussion on the chat and there's been a couple of, uh, I believe, good questions and also comments. So yeah. allow me to start with a comment. Um, so JPM48 was uh, commenting that, in his opinion, it would be super useful to have stuff like check add in the standard library. Is this yeah. what you just presented, the C20 functions? No, it, it, these are mostly comparators, and I, I agree. It would be very nice to have that. And I, I do believe there is a paper. Uh, uh, so if somebody knows uh, about that, then please uh, post the link in the chat. Uh, but I, I do believe there is at least one or two papers trying to, to get to that. But as far as I know, nothing has, uh, has been uh, approved. Yeah. So Andreas uh, actually just posted two papers from the... Um, from the yeah, so here are the links yeah. from the WG21 workgroup papers that apparently have not been um, accepted yet, but there yes. is the according proposals. Yes, excellent. Right. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> this was quick indeed. Yes. Um, then I have a question as somebody who's not particularly familiar with this. The code examples that you showed apparently are real code. Are companies yes. required to actually show the real code after some exploit has been detected or they do this voluntarily? So how, how do you get the, the real code from some projects like macOS, et cetera? Okay, so so the thing is, uh, so what often happens, so so when I, when I show you the real code, it might be reversed code. Uh, so 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 what you will see okay. is is uh, uh, so it's it's reverse code from binary, maybe it depends. like and and today, you can often get uh, some kind of crude attempts of 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 making C like code from from reverse code. And uh, so, so uh, tools uh, like Ida Pro or, or uh, Ghidra or will will give you C like code uh, from from reverse sections of the binary. Uh, but sometimes uh, it is released as a part of the CV or the statement from the company. And sometimes, of course, they're using open source software or they have certain parts that are open source, so you can see it. Uh, so yeah, it it really depends. All right. That's it for now. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Okay, so moving on. So this is uh, the last section of the talk. So if you're getting uh, antsy, it's not uh, as long as the first section. <laughs> okay, so let's uh, go back to 2010. Okay, so 2010 was a fantastic year for absolutely fantastic uh, looks. Uh, so Rihanna re released the, the epic Rude Boy and Lady Gaga released A Bad Romance after having released Poker Face uh, the year before, I believe. Uh, so it was, a, it was a great year for pop music. Uh, but if you're a nerd, you might uh, remember it more as uh, when uh, Apple released the, the first iPad. So it's, uh, uh, it was an epic year for changing how people use devices, I guess. Okay, and we're going to look at format string vulnerabilities. Now, these are, are uh, and, I, and I think one of the things, and I'm going to show you a little bit about this, but uh, one of the things that I think is, is the problem with format string vulnerabilities is that it has been perceived in the community as a solved problem. Uh, and, 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 and that is true for both uh, security and, and uh, C and C++. Uh, both both sides have kind of seen this as a solved problem. And I think that has, has lost some of the knowledge in the community for this. Uh, but back again to Frack Magazine. Uh, in 2000, and, so first of all, let's go to 2002. So let's do the first one. Uh, it had, that was like the, the peak of, of uh, format string exploitation. So it was in 2002 Advances in Format String Exploitation by Rick and Jira. Um, 
But then in, 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 in 2010, we are getting a eulogy for format strings. Uh, so this is when, when the security part or the binary exploitation part uh, um, the community basically considered this problem to have been solved and, and now was not possible uh, to exploit anymore. Uh, so let me first show you a little bit about uh, lesser known uh, format string uh, features. <laughs> uh, so uh, if you've ever made a, a terminal application or if you want to make a terminal application in the future, then some of these, uh, these features might be interesting to you. Uh, so first we're going to look at something called field width. Uh, so here, what we're trying to do is to do this. Uh, so we, we are trying to make a kind of a, a column size. And then when we put a number, it will, it will fit within that column. And so what we're going to do here is as we're doing that percent and then 17 and then D. So the D is going to print the number that is going to be passed as the first argument, which is 10. Uh, but the 17 is going to define the field width. Uh, uh, there are many different ways of doing this. Uh, so on line three, we are seeing it done in this way because you can even pass the field width as one of the parameters uh, to print out. And then here it's it's using an advanced technique that I'm not even going to go into right now, which is called direct access. But it basically, in direct access, you can pick um, the parameter uh, to to the to print it by position. So here we are saying we want to use uh, the first parameter to print f, so one dollar sign, uh, but we're going to to uh, pass it as a parameter. And so that's the 19 there. So this is, uh, it's, it's very advanced <laughs> doing uh, the, the things that you can do in a format string. Uh, then there's another feature. And I think this is probably one of those things that almost nobody knows. Um, and that is a very, it could be a very interesting feature or for if you're making a console application. So here we have a, a sign integer num. Uh, that is set to zero, and then we are going to to do a printf, and here we have say a b c d e f, and then percent n, and then uh, new line, and then we're passing in the address of num. Uh, the interesting thing is that if we do a printf on line four, where we're just printing out the value of num, uh, what you will see is that we when we run it, it will print a b c d e f but when we do the print f on line four it will print six and so this this is a feature of, of printf where we will actually be writing to memory so printf is not only writing is printing memory it is also writing to memory uh, by writing to to the num variable uh, and this has been used and was used uh, quite a lot in 32-bit exploitation of, of format strings uh, to, to overwrite uh, memory. So using it as a, as a write primitive. Uh, in 64-bit, this becomes a little bit more difficult because we're dealing with strings here and, and, uh, and pointers are also often contain uh, uh, null bytes or zeros in it. And so things can get more complicated. Um, but it can still be done. Uh, I, 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 I have, or I did have a functioning proof of concept. <laughs> okay, but it doesn't matter. Let's, uh, let's see uh, another thing. So here we're going to com uh, combine two of these techniques or these two techniques. Uh, so on line uh, three here, uh, we're doing a printf uh, and uh, to the format string, we are passing in our field width, which is here uh, is, uh, is a 42. We're going to, to do uh, uh, print uh, the number and then we're going to do a percent n. So that's going to write to num. Now, if we run the program, it's going to write a one like really, really far uh, out there. And then it's going to print 42. And the reason for that is that we passed in 42 as a field width. Uh, and therefore, uh, the, the value that was written to num was uh, the, the number of characters 
written to the console, which in this case is 42, uh, because that was our field width. And so what I want to demonstrate here is that you can control the value that is written uh, to memory in the format string itself. Uh, so, so this can get quite advanced. I have done, played around with this quite a lot, and it is probably the most annoying way to program in the world, uh, trying to create a functioning uh, exploit in a format string. Uh, so definitely do not recommend. Um, yeah. Okay, so, so we came from 2002, uh, where, so in 2002, this was like, the peak of format string uh, exploitation. By 2010, the binary exploitation community considered this problem solved, and it, it, it was and it was basically considered to be solved because uh, most compilers turned on uh, format string uh, warnings uh, by default. Uh, so so we ended up in a point where you had to explicitly turn off those warnings. Uh, to to get this problem, and most applications had dealt with it in some kind of global scale, uh, or going over their entire application in some way. So by by 2010, it was kind of considered to be a solved problem. Uh, but let's go to 2021 because we're in the future, right? So living in the future is fun. So we're going to go to Apple iOS and look at CVE 2021 uh, 3800. And from the CV, uh, it says joining a malicious Wi-Fi network may result in denial of service or arbitrary code execution. <laughs> so let's see how this came about. So as as uh, as the modern way to <laughs> to 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 drop an exploit, it was uh, unfortunately tweeted to the world. Uh, so this was the tweet, uh, after joining my personal Wi-Fi with the SSID percent %p, percent %s, percent %s, percent %s, percent %n, my iPhone permanently disabled its Wi-Fi functionality, neither rebooting nor changing the SSID fixes it. Now, if you are a regular normal person, uh, then this makes no sense. Uh, but coming from uh, a format string kind of print, printf language, uh, and, and of course, having seen percent %n before, uh, here we can see percent %p uh, prints a pointer, right? A percent %s pr prints a string. Uh, but what is, uh, what is really uh, interesting to me is the percent %n, because by then it's going to write to memory. And, and the thing that you probably know if you've played around with uh, printf type of functions is that if you don't pass in sufficient number of parameters to printf, it's just going to pick them. Uh, from a first, if, depending on your platform, it might pick them the first ones from registers. And then after that, it's going to be picking them from certain offsets on the stack. Uh, so in this case, it's it's probably picking some kind of pointer or interpreting some kind of pointer on the stack, um, uh, interpreting it as a pointer and then writing uh, a number there. And that is what is going to cause uh, the crash. Uh, and unfortunately, it's probably in some kind of list. So it keeps on being printed. The typical way that you would get uh, some kind of vulnerability like that is that there was, I'm assuming, probably a printf somewhere, which just uh, does a printf of the SSID uh, that it has seen. Uh, and the problem is that for printf, the first parameter print to printf is a format string. So even so if it can be controlled by an attacker, that format string can be used to leak memory and also to crash applications or even to write to memory to make a, a write primitive. So this, uh, this is old knowledge that we have kind of lost because we thought the problem was solved. Yes. How do you find these? Uh, so you could you could find uh, the the memory corruption itself uh, most likely with address sanitizer. Again, uh, if you haven't played around with address sanitizer, it's like it's you should start today. Uh, address sanitizer is currently supported basically everywhere, even. On Windows, MSVC supports uh, address sanitizer and, and uh, for about two or three years for 32-bit and at least a year and a half or something for 64-bit. Turning it on has become increasingly uh, easier 
Uh, so, so, and it is in, in Clang and GCC. Uh, most kernel uh, uh, kernels have an address sanitizer. So there's a, a one called KSAN for the Linux kernel, and there are, are sanitizers for most other kernels for the BSD kernels. I'm sure the Windows kernel also has uh, uh, sanitizers. So uh, get familiar with address sanitizer. It will really help you uh, debug uh, memory corruption and crashes and, and things like that. Yeah. Uh, the thing is, also there are, have been warnings uh, for this uh, since uh, since probably 2010, uh, and they've been turned on by default. So, so this is something that you should be getting warnings for. And if you're not getting warnings for it, somebody probably turned them off, and you should probably have a look at that. Uh, and that brings us to our our uh, uh, third questions. This is the last one before the end. <laughs> So thank you very much. Um, I, I do have a couple of questions since I am curious. I admit that I did not hear about the integer sanitizer yet. In, in which compilers is this already implemented? Uh, it, I think it's in both Clang and GCC, no. uh, but it is not in, in the Windows compiler. All right. Uh, as so far as I know, at least. Been, because I was surprised to hear about this. Uh, so, so integer sanit. I okay. So I have to look it up. I have a feeling it came in Clang nine. Uh, somebody can probably Google it better than me right now. So, so yeah. please comment in the. Uh, but I have a feeling it, it came in nine. Right. Um, and I do have a conclusion after this, by the way. So, so there's it's just uh, I I wanted questions for this yeah, session. Sure. Okay, yes. sorry. <laughs> no, 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 I just I realized I was unclear before. <laughs> um, I have another question though. Yeah. All of these printf uh, attacks are basically the good old C functions. Yeah. And of course, there's kind of the ration, uh, uh, rationale that in C++ we don't use them anymore. Uh, how often do you actually see them in C++ code? Uh, so so this is this is the problem. You shouldn't be seeing them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is what I mean. But 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 uh, the, the 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 level of of uh, of how much we have converted older code bases will depend, okay. and how much control we have. Like if people have turned off these warnings, mm -hmm. uh, then then what you will see often with junior programmers is that they will often use a printf uh, mm -hmm. to just print out a value just so they can see it in the logs. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so it's 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 something that you will see, especially I think uh, junior programmers pull out just to reassure themselves of what is going on. Uh, it's also been a source of other types of bugs where people have been printing passwords, for example, to log files uh, and things like that, uh, so that those passwords have later been picked up uh, if, when somebody got an access to the logs. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we have a tendency to want to to print things that we maybe shouldn't be printing. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, that's something we should have be more conscious of, that when we are logging, we should make sure that both we're doing it safely and that we're not logging sensitive information. All right. So, OK, then please <laughs> go on. No, yeah, no, no more questions? OK, so that brings us uh, kind of to, to my conclusion. Um, so, we have looked at at uh, this timeline, and we are seeing these two communities kind of working in parallel, uh, but working at, mm, on two sides of, of the same kind of, of, of thing. So, so looking at the problem from two different types of dimensions. And, and I, I sometimes say it's, uh, it's a little bit like in Stranger Things, where you have like an upside down world. It, it is the same world, but it's, but it's a different world. And I, and I think it's very important that we, currently we are very separated into our own communities and there isn't a lot of, of, of bridging uh, of the two communities. And I think that uh, that makes us less safe and it's something that we should get better at. Um, so, so we can see that even things that are considered to be quite old types of vulnerabilities are still occurring in modern software and not in like hobby projects, but in like uh, really uh, uh, prestigious uh, consumer software that is considered to be probably at the cutting edge of, of, of uh, current computer engineering. Uh, so 
we like to think that we are living in the future, that what we are doing now, programming in 2022, is very different than where we were in 2000 and, and, and earlier. But what we're seeing is that we keep on making the same types of mistakes and I think one of the parts of that is not actually uh, understanding uh, the other community. Uh, and so what I'm hoping to see in the future is, is more C++ and C programmers uh, maybe participating in and presenting at uh, security conferences and also the other way so that we're getting more security people uh, uh, participating in, in our conferences. To, to kind of both make available the language uh, that is being used so that you understand each other, uh, but also to, to, uh, to refresh uh, some of that learning that, that we keep on forgetting over time. Um, so I guess what, what I'm, I'm trying to say is that we can, we can do some cross-community learning and learn from each other. And, and one of the things that I hope that I have convinced you of in this talk is is that we are making the same mistakes over and over again. And, and maybe if we learn from each other more, then we could prevent making these mistakes in the future. Uh, so thank you so much. And that is now my final question slide. So if you have any more questions, now is the time. All right. Then first of all, thank you very much for the talk. I really enjoyed it. And I do think I learned a lot. Um, I know already gave all the questions, except for for Roy. He has another question about Rust, which I kind of skip. <laughs> so sorry, Roy. Go to the uh, the after talk chat. Uh, the the usual questions about should we uh, switch to Rust? Mm -hmm. But um, I, I liked your your summary. Um, I, I kind of just have a final question for that. Uh, of course, one of the problems that this that we see these same problems again and again is, is just the, the complexity of these systems, the, yes. the mind boggling. So, it, it, do you see any, any solution to that problem that we have to take care of so many details in our code? Anything that could save us here? So, so what we have today that we didn't have as much before is, is it, we're getting progressively uh, better tooling. Uh, so, so, the, the problem is that this tooling has been uh, embraced uh, quite a lot in the binary exploitation community, but but not to a sufficient degree in the actually uh, in the pro systems programming community. Uh, so so what you will see, um, uh, uh, Microsoft has 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 written blog posts where they say that that uh, memory safety is a big issue because they're seeing a lot of vulnerabilities that are related to memory safety. A rest, rest question, mm -hmm. um, but I was a little bit skeptical of this this data because if they present the data, it looks very convincing. Uh, but the the problem that I, the thing that I've been seeing is that the tooling to find uh, memory errors has gotten extremely good. So, so go going from where we were basically uh, left with Valgrind or cache grind or things like that, which was which was very unwieldy and very slow and 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 difficult to use. Uh, today we have uh, address sanitizer, which is basically just a, a command line flag away uh, to give us a stack trace and all sorts of things. Great, is absolutely amazing programming experience. Uh, we have fuzzers uh, that are easy to use, and we even have built-in fuzzers. Uh, so you will find um, libfuzzer in Clang, which is extremely easy, it's basically like writing a unit test to be able to fuzz your applications. The thing that we're seeing, though, is that both address sanitizers, uh, address sanitizer and fuzzers, uh, and un undefined behavior sanitizer mm -hmm. is being used a lot by security engineers. And mm -hmm. uh, so, so what we're seeing is that, so I asked, I asked Microsoft uh, on, uh, or uh, the, the guy who, who wrote this, uh, I, oh, mm -hmm. what's his name? Oh, it's, oh, I forgot his name, Matt, Matt, something, I think. Anyway, so I asked him, where are you getting the vulnerabilities? Because they're saying that they're getting a lot of memory related mem uh, vulnerabilities. So where are you getting them from? And what, how did they find them? Uh, and so he goes, I don't know. But, and then he referred me to somebody else who was, and, and he says, we're getting a lot from them. So you can ask them. And so I asked them and they were like, oh yeah, no, that's fuzzing an address sanitizer. Okay. <laughs> so, so the thing is, I'm not sure if the data is, 
the data is being influenced by the, in, the, 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 the great tooling that we're getting to find these bugs. The mm-hmm. problem is that the tooling is not being used sufficiently by, by the programmers, but it is being used by people who are trying to exploit their programs. So, so that is one of the things that I want to change. I want us to use these tools, which are much easier to use by us than it is for them. Yeah. And, and, and we can find our bugs ourselves uh, before they are being exploited. Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> it's a very long answer to the question. But, but a very good one. I like it. Yeah, so in short, uh, use the tools that you have yeah. available today. Yes. All right. I think this is a great summary indeed. So thanks again. This was great. I enjoyed it a lot. What I've now just posted uh, a few minutes ago in the uh, um, in our chat was a link to the Zoom meeting, our after talk chat. So if you now want to meet Patricia in person, our or Marcus, uh, then um, you can meet both of them quite easily by just joining the Zoom meeting. So if you have additional questions or if you just want to chat with other C++ enthusiasts, this is your opportunity. So I hope I see a lot of a lot of you. Then both to uh, Patricia and Marcus, thanks again. This was great. And we see uh, you next time in our July meeting. Um, so in approximately one month. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.